So welcome back. The last clustering approach that I want to cover is known as hierarchical clustering. And this is also one of the oldest approaches. If we go back to the figure that we started the whole module with, there's actually two methods here, Ward's method and agglomerative clustering, that are both examples of this hierarchical approach. In looking at the solutions, what we see is that agglomerative clustering does an amazing job on these crescents. It can handle the rings. It does a really good job on these clusters that have unequal spread. Of course, it nails the easy case, but it has a few issues with the elongated clusters. So what is this approach? Hierarchical clustering methods assume a different type of data. So they're going to assume distance data rather than coordinates. So if you think about what we've been doing with both k-means and Gaussian mixtures, the starting point is the X matrix. I've had, for example, observations 1 through n, and I have x1 and x2 in there. These give the coordinates that I go plot in two-dimensional space. That's what I call coordinate data. With hierarchical clustering, the starting point is going to be a distance matrix. So I have observations 1 through n on the rows, and 1 through n on the columns as, as well. And every entry, so d, i, j, equals the distance between rows or observations i and j. Now this opens up some other possibilities for us. With k-means, we implicitly use Euclidean distance. What if we cannot use Euclidean distance? Maybe we have some categorical variables and we need to use Jacquard's di distance or the matching coefficient. Well, with hierarchical clustering, that's okay. We just need any old distance metric that describes the distance or dissimilarity between observations i and j. Starting with these distance measures, there are two algorithmic approaches. These are classified as agglomerative and divisive. Here's the idea of agglomerative. With agglomerative, our algorithm starts out by assuming every observation is its own cluster. We then go find the distances between the clusters and merge the two clusters that are closest. We have to recompute the distances, and we keep doing that until we reach the desired number of clusters. So at most, we're going to go through this algorithm n minus 1 times. The divisive approach does the opposite. We start with one giant cluster, and we say, what's the best way to divide this cluster into two clusters? Then we say, well, of these two clusters, what's the best way that I could divide it further? As we let the algorithm run to completion, we'll end up with every observation being its own cluster. So I'll now go sketch out a quick example for us. Let's say that this is my data set. Perhaps it's sitting on the Euclidean plane. Every observation is its own cluster. So the first step of this algorithm is find the two observations that are closest to each other. I think it's these two. I now make a new cluster that consists of those two observations. The next step is go find the two observations. So this becomes a composite observation. The tricky part is how do I evaluate the distance between other observations and this cluster? We'll touch on that in a minute. Let's just um, ignore that for now. So then which, uh, which two observations are closest to each other? I think this is closest to here. So that becomes a new cluster. So notice we have one fewer cluster. Next step is, well, which two observations are closest? I think these two are, so we're going to join those up. The next step is, well, go find the two closest observations. I think it's these two. Then I think this one's going to join up here. This one's going to join up here. Then we're going to say, well, which two clusters are closest to each other? I think these two are going to join up. Finally, this cluster is going to get joined with the others, and we have a single cluster in the data. So the idea would stop this joining process where, by doing so, it increases some 
measure like SSE or F or the, or the silhouette statistic. So before getting into some of the details, let me make a few comments about this. Hierarchical clustering assumes a hierarchical structure. So once two observations are joined, they can never be split apart. So once I have joined these two cases in a cluster, they can never get split apart. That's not the case with k-means or Gaussian mixtures, where two, two observations that are joined in, say, the five-cluster solution could be in different segments if I go out to, if I reduce the number of clusters. So hierarchical clustering, as with k-means, is sensitive to outliers and scaling. We can do things to reduce that. For example, I could use the Manhattan metric instead of Euclidean, and that would reduce the sensitivity to outliers. With scaling, we're going to have the same issues as with k-means. The usual solution is to standardize the variables ahead of time. There are some distance metrics that do that standardization for you. So, so Mahalanobis distances, which we're not going to cover in this class, are one example of a distance metric that does that scaling. It's very important to know that hierarchical clustering is computationally harder than k-means. And therefore, it's not going to be suitable for very large data sets. So why is this? Well, let's think about the computations that are involved. So if we look at my picture, the absolute first thing I need to do is to compute a distance matrix. So this distance matrix is going to have n rows and n columns. Most of the distance metrics that we're going to use are symmetric, so we only need to worry about half of that but that's still of order n squared. Then what do I do? Well, I have to go through this entire set of on order n squared distances and find the smallest one. Then I have to repeat that process n times. So the upshot is these hierarchical clustering methods tend to be of, of order n cubed. So if you take a thousand cubed, you're at a billion operations. And that's a pretty large number that grows very quickly with n. So this method is fine if you have dozens or hundreds of cases. You just don't want to use it if you have, say, tens of thousands of cases. The final issue to be aware of is the one that I hinted at a minute ago, which is it's very sensitive to how we recompute distances. So once I've joined two observations into a new cluster, how do I determine the similarity between that new cluster and all the other observations. So how do I compute this distance, that distance, and that distance? There are literally dozens of methods that have been proposed to handle this problem. But to give you a sense of some of the issues, let me go over four of the main ones. So average, single, complete, and wards method are four very important methods. Average linkage says this, the distance between two clusters is the average distance between all pairs of observations. What is the distance between this point and this new cluster? Take this distance and this distance and average them and you get the new measure. Single linkage says the new distance is going to be the minimum while complete linkage says take the maximum. So if I go over to my picture again, let's consider this observation with this cluster. So what is the distance between this observation and this cluster? I should have been more careful when I drew this, but I think this distance is shorter than this distance. So with single linkage, the distance between this observation and this cluster would be the shortest distance between a point in that cluster, in this case here, and that point. Under complete linkage, it would be the largest distance. The advantage of this single linkage is it enables what's referred to as chaining. So let's say my cluster looks something like this. I have my, my rings. So if I found two cluster that, clusters that were close to each other, it might be these two, then I would say, well, what, what are the next two closest observations? Well, I think it's these two. What are the next two observations that are closest? Maybe it's these two. 
but you can see what's happening is I'm I'm forming a chain with a single linkage. I'm not going to get that with complete linkage. Single linkage is going to be exceptionally good for that problem with rings. It would also be very good for the crescents that we saw in the uh, Python figure. Ward's method is going to be more like k-means in that at each step, we're going to try to find a pair of clusters that would minimize the increase in the within cluster variance after merging it. So in essence, it has the same objective function as k-means. It's just that we're getting there in a hierarchical way as opposed to the approach followed by k-means. Let's go over an example. So the typical starting point for hierarchical clustering is the distance matrix. I found this distance matrix out on the web, which gives the distances between 24 cities in Europe. So we can see Barcelona all the way through Warsaw. And so this will be the starting point. So if I go look at what I read in, we have our distance matrix. And so we notice that it's a triangular matrix with the upper triangle not being displayed. So the distance between Belgrade and Barcelona is the same as the dis distance between Barcelona and Belgrade, therefore we don't need both of them. We're not very interested in the distance between Barcelona and itself, and therefore we don't bother to display it. To run a hierarchical cluster in R, we're going to use the hclust argument. We give it a distance matrix, and we give it the method. So this can be average, single, complete, or wards. So let's go run that. The way we usually interpret one of these solutions is to plot it. The plot is a dendrogram. What we see on the vertical axis is the distance at which two cities get joined. And we have all the cities as leaves of this tree. So what we can see is that cities that join very low tend to be close together. So Brussels and Paris come together early on, Berlin and Hamburg, Budapest and Vienna, Munich and Prague. And what we see forming here is kind of a list of cities in Eastern Europe. So you have Warsaw, Budapest, Vienna, and Prague. We have another list of cities here that would be, looks like Northern Germany and, and Denmark. So Copenhagen, Berlin, and Hamburg. Uh, eventually those two come together off on the left, we have cities in the far north, so Stockholm, Kiev, St. Petersburg, Moscow goes in with that, and we can trace how these cities go together. Fit dollar merge records how the cities go together, so the output is not particularly user-friendly. This says the sixth city and the 23rd city come together. So if we look on the web page, the sixth city is one, two, three, four, five, six. Budapest and, and Vienna go together. So that forms a new cluster, which is going to be displayed as a positive number. So clusters, this becomes cluster one. And you're going to see that gets joined up with cluster five. Well, what's cluster five? It's cities eight, 16 and 18, which got merged at some point. You can see city seven gets joined up with cluster two. What's cluster two? Well, it's cities three and nine. So that's the way R's output works. I'm gonna close this lecture on hierarchical methods with a quote from the Ebert book, and I'll just read through this with you. So hierarchical clustering forms the backbone of cluster analysis and practice. These approaches are widely available in software packages and easy to use. The investigator needs to make choices about the measure of proximity. So are you going to use Euclidean or Manhattan or Jacquard's method? The clustering method and often the number of clusters. The main problem with these methods in practice is that no particular clustering method can be recommended. Since methods that have favorable mathematical properties, so single linkage has some nice properties, but they often don't produce interpretable results in, empirically. Furthermore, 
In order to use the results, we have to choose some partition and the best way of choosing exactly where to stop is not really clear. When a particular partition is required and there's no underlying hierarchy, so if you have a hierarchy as you would with, say, evolutionary biology, you would have a strong motivation. But if you don't have such a hierarchy, then k-means may be more appropriate or some of the model-based approaches like uh, finite mixture models or latent class analysis.